Thank you, Dr. Tushman, for that nice introduction. Um, we have just a few minutes today to cover a lot. So right now, I'd like to ask everybody to picture someone in your mind that you love the most in the world. It could be your father, your mother, your wife, your husband. And imagine that they just came back from Iraq or Afghanistan, and they have post-traumatic stress disorder. And they're not connecting with you like they used to. They're in a shell. Um, you can't get them to go out. You can't get them to leave their room. They're sad, moody, depressed, and angry. They're not the person that you used to know. And you know that there's this great treatment that can help them a lot. But it's not offered in your area. And the nearest place to get it is three hours away. And you can't even get them to go get a cup of coffee. So you know that they're not going to go three hours away. Um, so I think that when we ground ourselves in how important delivering these treatments are through examples like this, we get to see how important telehealth is. And I'm really excited to be here. And I really want to thank Dr. Tushman and Ms. Montalvo for hosting us today to talk about transformation in telehealth because it's very important. When we think about telehealth, it's a very large issue. And we all necessarily in the system come at it from different perspectives. So I'd like to share some of the questions that dominate my perspective. The first is, what VA mental health services are effective enough to merit using this resource? It is a limited resource right now. We want to be wise in how we use it. In this sense, our technology platforms give us an opportunity to self-assess and figure out, OK, what treatments do we want to bring into the digital era? How do we want to update the content of what we do? And that's a very exciting thing to be part of. Um, halfway through the presentation, I'm going to switch away from presenting how telehealth improves access to services, because we really want it to improve access to effective services. That's really the key. Um, and we're talking about how technology can take our best treatments and make it even better. Um, so with regards to the first question in PTSD, the answer is relatively simple. A number of expert consensus guidelines tell us that exposure therapy for PTSD is the gold standard treatment. Um, the Institute of Medicine in 2007, at the request of the VA, did a large literature search, and they concluded even stronger that exposure therapy is the only effective treatment for combat-related PTSD. And we just have more recent evidence, a thorough literature review, indicated that prolonged exposure therapy, which is sort of the name brand that we teach and use in the VA, is even more effective in regular VA medical centers than it was in the randomized controlled trials that supported the treatment in the first place. So this is very good news for our veterans and for our providers. So I want to talk a little bit about what prolonged exposure therapy it is. It is very easy when we're talking about telehealth to get caught up in the technology. But as all the speakers did a wonderful job of talking about before, and is that this is really about relationships and providing care. So if we understand just a little bit about the care, it really colors in the picture about how important these uh, technology platforms can be to us. So prolonged exposure therapy is a weekly therapy protocol. It involves education. It involves self-assessment of distress and anxiety. In vivo exposure, which is exposing yourself to safe situations that you've maybe been avoiding, and repeated prolonged imaginal exposure to the distressing memories. In a nutshell, this treatment helps folks face their fears so they can get over them. Not cope with them, not deal with them, but get over them. And that's the goal of the treatment. We know it's effective, not because outside experts tell us, but because VA folks have done their homework. There's a lot of studies that been done in VA settings, and this slide's provided just for your reference for later on. The take-home message is that this treatment is extremely effective, and many people going through it lose a diagnosis altogether. We know that this treatment works because we ask veterans. And you can see here PTSD symptoms on the left and depression on the right, and you can see that they drop over the course of treatment. And this is a very typical graph. We see this over and over again in our different treatments. We know that statistically speaking, the people that end the treatment end with a lower diagnosis rate of PTSD and lower self-reported symptoms. And we know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. More personally, what does this mean? It means that folks coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that want to go to college can, because they can focus on their schoolwork without being paranoid in large auditoriums. It means that fathers and mothers and grandfathers can connect with their families in ways that they may, maybe haven't been able to do in years. And interestingly, uh, this treatment works just as well for veterans of Vietnam era as it does for OEF, OEF, OND veterans. It means that people can go back to sleep without having to worry about being haunted by nightmares every night. It's just a very wonderful thing to be a part of. 
Administratively, what does this mean? Well, when we push this treatment out to folks and make it available, we're actually reducing the overall need for mental health services by as much as 50% for the people that complete treatment. In fact, 25% of the people that complete this treatment use mental health services at the VA once or not at all in the entire year after finishing. This is a marked departure from how this population typically uses services in the VA. Um, it's tempting to think that this might save us money, but really, you know, myself and most other PTSD administrators, we want our clinics to, to be operating at full capacity at all times. So really what this translates into is we get to provide access to more specialty care to more veterans because we're now we're more efficient. So this is definitely one of those treatments we want to push out. We want uh, prolonged exposure to be available in every nook and cranny of this country. Anywhere there's a veteran that has PTSD, we want this treatment to be available. And so, of course, we necessarily need clinical video teleconferencing to reach that goal. But how is a treatment that's designed to make people anxious on purpose, how does that work over video teleconferencing? Well, about six years ago, we started piloting it in Charleston to our community outreach clinics in Buford and Savannah and Myrtle Beach. And what we found was similar graphs. You can see here, once again, PTSD symptoms on the left, depression on the right, and the dotted line represents folks that got the treatment over telehealth technology. And there's no real differences there. Um, interestingly, even though this is not a treatment for depression, uh, depression typically lifts when PTSD symptoms lift. And if we think about that, that kind of makes sense. We've done this study four or five different ways, and so have other groups, and we're always finding similar results, that it's relatively easy to deliver this treatment over clinical video teleconferencing. The harder nut to crack is all the relationships interpersonally that go on between the facilities, uh, clinicians talking to administrators, referral streams, things like that. A lot of these issues have been uh, problem solved. And I was actually very humbled yesterday when I had the opportunity to come here and listen to all the presentations because a lot of the problems that we've experienced in the past in pushing telehealth out are being solved by people in this room. Um, and you're going to get a chance to hear about the very exciting innovations that help us not only engage with our patients better, but with each other and in our different facilities. It's a really wonderful time. So I'd like to switch gears now. Um, in addition to increasing access to effective care, how can technology help us improve this treatment? Well, if we look at the problems with this treatment, we see that like all behavioral treatments, there's a dropout rate. Um, it's not any higher for this treatment than it is for other treatments, but Folks that drop out at about 30, 35% don't get any benefit from the treatment at all. Folks that drop out from treatment also continue to use VA mental health services at the same or higher levels over the long term. So in a sense, we've got the right diagnosis with the right disorder, with the right treatment, the right therapist, the right patient, the right technology, and the right administrative platform all coming together at the same time. It's really sort of like what I call a, a, a holy inner crossroads. We don't want to blow it by dropout. So again, to figure out how technology might be helping us, I think it's important to ground ourselves in what this treatment is and what it does. So exposure therapy helps patients identify with their most distressing memories and sit with them long enough for them to get over them. For this veteran here, he had an intrusive memory and nightmare of a child dying in Iraq by accident. Um, and after a couple of sessions where we got to know him and explained how the treatment works, we invited him to do an imaginal exposure, which is he comes in and he closes his eyes and he recounts the child's death in vivid detail over and over and over again. And every five minutes we're asking him, how distressed are you? How distressed are you? And really it's every five minutes we train folks to have their stopwatches and do it every five minutes. Um, it's a really an antiquated way to get at anxiety. How anxious are you on a zero to 100 scale? But it's how we do things. It's how we've been treating anxiety for 40 years. Um, it seems to work OK. And you can see the first exposure, uh, he rated pretty high. Second exposure, he peaked up a little bit higher, which is common. It's a very common pattern. And it took three, four, five exposures for this veteran to really start understanding hey, this is working for me. This treatment's going to help me feel better. The problem with this is that when we see dropout, it usually happens early on in the treatment process, you know, between sessions one and two or two and three, before the veterans get a chance to see the treatment working for them. So we thought about this and we said, well, how can technology help us with this? We've got this great treatment that works really well, 
but there's this dropout rate, and we've got this really antiquated way of assessing anxiety. And we know that when people's anxiety levels come down and they say that out loud, it really helps them engage with the treatment. It gives them hope. Um, so we decided, why don't we measure physiological responses and add that to the subjective ratings of distress? Maybe that'll help patients engage more. One of the problems with that is traditionally, measuring psychophysiological responses in the context of PTSD takes a lot of provider expertise. There's a lot of wires. There's complicated programming, and there's all this sort of stuff. But nowadays, with new technology, we can take something like this um, and pop it on a wristband, and it measures physiological arousal. It's wireless. It has a battery life of 72 hours. It only has one button, so even folks like me can use it. Um, in fact, I was wearing this before I came on today, and I can share those results via email with folks. You'll be able to see me getting more anxious as my uh, time to speak came up. Um, and if I continued to wear it, you'd be able to see it come down as well. So this next slide is the same veteran, same exposures, but now instead of looking at subjective ratings, we're looking at objective physiological responses. And we can see that his second session now is much lower than the first. And the difference between the third and the second is bigger than it was on the subjective ratings. So we're very aggressively piloting this because we're very excited about these results. Um, and so far, we've been surprised at how easy it is to document these declines between the first, second, third, and fourth exposures. And when we show this to veterans, when they're done with their exposure, wonderful things happen. Uh, it showed me that my reactions are not just mental, that I'm actually having a physical response that can go away. I spent most of my time trying to distract myself from memories in Iraq, so it was counterintuitive, almost crazy to me to think about them on purpose. Being able to see that the exposures were helping my body relaxed helped me to trust the process and what my doc was saying. And this is exactly what we're trying to get at. We're trying to get that trust because we know the treatment works. So in clinical tests so far, this application of showing people their physiological responses has led to a 60% drop in dropout. Now, it's just a pilot trial, and we need to make sure that we replicate it in scientific ways, and we've got to roll up our sleeves and do the work. But if we can actually replicate just a 5% drop in dropout, we're cooking with gas. So we're really excited about these results. Um, what else can we do with this? Well, instead of just sending somebody out to the local mall to, to do their exposures and say, well, go to the food court and see how you feel, now we can send them out with this thing. And via Bluetooth, we can be watching their physiological responses back at the VAMC. And if they have a smartphone, we can be zapping them, their responses, as they go throughout the day. Um, so what does that do? That really connects us to, to our patient. And whenever we increase connectivity between a patient getting exposure therapy and a therapist, that's a good thing. Um, it also gives the veteran valuable information that they can use to, to carry out their mission. Um, and they can know that they're doing it the right way. My therapist said, I'm not supposed to leave here until I've calmed down by 50%. Well, now they've got an objective measure that they can use. And if they've got to sit there for four hours, they've got to sit there for four hours. But I'll tell you what, the next time they go into that mall, they're going to feel a lot better. Um, so when we're, when we're thinking about how technology can help us, I, I want to talk about and the underlying principle that you've heard every speaker talk about. It's, that, it's the relationships, really. When we engage in our relationships in a way that helps us communicate to people that they don't have to be stuck with this disorder, that there's actually hope out there. It's really a wonderful thing. Um, and as you're going to be hearing from the folks that are coming after me today, um, there's just great things in the pipeline. Um, I thank you all for your time and your attention.